It is wonderful to see so many of you out here and students and friends to uh, celebrate and show our support for France today. Uh, France and the US, U.S. have been allies since the birth of our country. In fact, at the siege of Yorktown, there were nearly as many French soldiers as there were Americans fighting against the British. Today, we are again united in the global struggle against terrorism. His Excellency Gérard Arrault was appointed to his current position as the, um, the French ambassador to the U.S. in September 2014, having previously held numerous positions within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Development, including permanent representative of France to the U.N. in New York for five years, Director General of Political Affairs and Security, Ambassador to Israel, and Director for Strategic Affairs, Security, and Disarmament, he also acted as a French negotiator on the, Iran on the Iranian nuclear issue. In New York at the Se Security Council, he contributed to the adoption of resolutions on Libya, the Ivory Coast, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Mali, and the Central African Republic. And he participated in debates on the Syrian and Ukrainian crises. His numerous journal articles include two on the outbreak of World War I, one on French foreign policy in the Entre-deux-Guerres from 1919 to 1939, and another on the search for a new world order. Ambassador Arrault is currently working on an article on the Treaty of Versailles. And uh, allow me to say just a, a word in French. Uh, nous avons ici sur notre campus mille étudiants qui suivent des cours de français sur la littérature française, l'histoire de la France et la langue française. De la part de notre famille de francophones et de francophiles ici à BYU, Monsieur l'Ambassadeur, Madame la Consule, nous tenons à vous exprimer notre sympathie pour les Français et notre solidarité avec la France. Comme le dit Chateaubriand dans ses Mémoires d'outre-tombe, les moments de crise produisent un redoublement de vie chez les âmes. Suite aux événements tragiques que nous avons connus récemment à Paris, nous souhaitons à la France un avenir plein d'espoir de réjouissance, de paix et de vie. Ambassador Arrault's talk today is entitled French Foreign Policy and Crisis Management. Please join me in welcoming him to BYU. Thank you. You know, it's a, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, before, before starting, I, I want to say how much we have been moved by uh, the outpouring of expressions of solidarity and, and friendship and support coming from our American friends, from the President Obama to all the Americans. We have received thousands of messages at the French Embassy, and, and they were everywhere. You know a lot of symbols. I've never, been, I've never heard so many people singing La Marseillaise, actually. <laughs> Um, as I was saying, I guess that the, the author of the Marseillaise was turning in his grave, you know, really <laughs> listening to the way it was sung, but uh, uh, it, was, it, was, it was really moving, so thank you very much, and, and uh, the French flag was also everywhere. I, I will basically, um, so thank you for the invitation to the BYU, and um, I will touch three topics. Uh, basically, the first one will be in a sort of methodological uh, introduction because I am a bit a teacher in the closet, so really to try to explain you what is a diplomat. After that, I will touch two points. One is, of course, the Paris attacks and their meaning, and, and the second one will be the COP21, which is, the, you may know, the big climate change conference which is ongoing in Paris right now. So in terms, in methodological terms, the problem when you are a diplomat, you know, is that everybody believes they understand foreign relations and they tell you, you know, really you should do that, that, and that, and, and it's always uh, a bit of a problem. So really I will, I will try to, to tell you not to say it anymore when you meet a diplomat. <laughs> the problem, the basic problem that uh, a citizen, you know, uh, is facing when he's addressing international issues is that his first reaction, the first reaction of the citizen is to say A is right and B is wrong. You know, A is right, is being wrong, so my country should support A, period. And, and if you, your country doesn't do it, you consider it's a, it's a really, it's a cynical 
or uh, it's a bad foreign policy. The problem is that in any conflict, uh, each side is convinced to be right. Each side is convinced to be right. So in a sense, to say right or wrong is a bit irrelevant. Because the other side, he doesn't believe he's wrong. You know, really, he, know if he believes he's right. I give you a very good example, which is the Ukrainian crisis. As you know, uh, Russia has uh, taken a chunk of, of Ukraine, which is clearly a violation of international law. So you say, OK, they're wrong, so we have to fight them. You know, the Russians are wrong. The problem is that actually the Russian president is supported by 85% of the Russians. You can say, oh, the Russians are stupid, stupid, or the Russians are victims of propaganda. No, they really, the Russian people are behind their president in an overwhelming majority. And when you reach this sort of a point, if you want to understand foreign policy, is what I always say to my, to, to my diplomats, you have to put yourself in the shoes of the other side. Why, if you are a Russian, well-informed Russian, could you consider that actually the foreign policy of your country is right? And, and that becomes interesting, you know. It's simply the fact is that you won't meet any Russian, any Russian, who will tell you that Ukraine is a foreign country. Basically, Ukraine has been part of Russia for three, four centuries. Basically, uh, uh, you know, my Russian colleague in, in uh, in Washington DC actually is from an Ukrainian family. So all the Russians simply they consider that the breakout of, you know, the breakup of um, Soviet Union was a sort of an incredible uh, mistake uh, that in any case, Ukraine, you know, really has to be, to remain solid, you know, really a sort of relation for some solidarity or, you know, friend of Russia and for some others coming back to Russia. So it, when, you are, when you reach this conclusion, so you say, okay, for the Russians, really Ukraine is something special. It doesn't mean that you say the Russians are right, but it means that it's a fact because you have to be analytical. So the question that after that you have to, to the, the conclusion you can, you can uh, draw is that if the Russians consider that really Ukraine is part of the, their, their community or their cultural or historical community, they are ready to go very far, you know, really, for, to, for, to prevent Ukraine from leaving this sphere, you know, really, this cultural sphere, very far. So being analytical, you know, you'll say, okay, what if I, I really want to confront Russia, it means, that's the conclusion, that I'm ready to, be ver to go very far. You know, it's like a poker game. You know, you have to guess how much money the other side is ready to put on the table. So in this case, you conclude the Russians are ready to put a lot of money on the table. And the question that you have to ask yourself is, am I ready to, to put as much money as the Russians? And the answer is very clear. Yes, let's go. No, you have to stop. You know, so what lesson I would want maybe you could learn is when you are in front of an international crisis, a conflict as, for instance, acute and difficult as the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Don't say the Israelis are right, the Palestinians are right, the, Israeli, the, the Israelis are wrong or the Palestinians are wrong. It's irrelevant. Simply look at each side, the way you can see the conflict from, its, from his side. You know, really, if you are an Israeli with what happens in the, in the streets, if you are a Palestinian, you know, what, what, what is really what happened when the, 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 the Jewish uh, uh, immigrants arrived in, an, in the end of the 19th century. And, and after that, try to conclude in analytical terms, trying to guess the intentions of the both sides and the balance of power. Because at the end of the day, and it's not because I'm French and I'm diplomat, so I'm twice cynical, uh, <laughs> Usually, the one, you, the, the one who wins is not the one who is right or is wrong. It's simply the one who wins is the stronger. So uh, my advice will be uh, from when you try to, to understand foreign policy is, you know, really, again, that you go into this, the, the really forgetting for once saying who is right, who is wrong, but really looking at the balance of power, looking at what the both sides how the both sides 
see, see the conflict. You know, I, maybe, uh, maybe you have had, uh, you know, a private row with your uh, boyfriend, girlfriend, or, or, or your parents, and you have a row, you're convinced to be right, and after that there is a reconciliation coming, and suddenly you realize that the other side actually had a good reason also to believe that the, the other side was right. Unfortunately, the, the, the real life is exactly like this. So that was my first uh, methodological point. I will come to an, a, a, a second point, which is much more, in a sense, serious, which is, of course, the, the Paris attacks. We were expecting uh, new attacks after the, few, the first uh, terrorist uh, uh, attacks in January. Um, because basically, what is, uh, hap what is happening in France right now, in Europe right now, is the radicalization of, uh, of, of youth, uh, which is radicalization of thousands, actually, of young Muslims. Um, and the first problem that we are facing, of course, is uh, we are democracies, which is not a problem, but we are democracies, which means that you don't arrest people because of their opinion. So these thousands of radicalized youth uh, uh, it means thousands, uh, and you can even say maybe more than 10,000. You can't monitor them 24-7. To monitor a person, you need 12 agents. To monitor a person 24-7, you need at least 12 agents. So if you have, you know, thousands of them, you can't. The problem is that it means that it's very difficult to know, to guess, whether they are going to cross the red line of terrorism. So we have this sort of, this, this problem in our cities. But on the top of that, we have the Syrian crisis. The Syrian crisis means that thousands of Europeans, and actually for, for the Americans, it, the figure is only 100, but thousands of youth, of, of these radicalized youth, are going to Syria to fight. For France alone, we have identified 1,900, 1,900 youth French who came to Syria are in Syria or are back from Syria. Right now, we think that at any moment you have 600 French fighting in Syria, 140 being killed already, by the way. So these people go there and they come back. And they come back, of course, radicalized, uh, military trained, and rapidly anti Semitic because one part of their ideology is, is a, a rabid anti Semitism. When I say 16 or 1900, the problem is, of course, the people we have identified because, you know, they don't come to the police station saying I go to Syria. Uh, and it's very easy to go to Syria from Paris. You take a bus for 50 euro uh, from the gate of Paris, which goes to Istanbul in Turkey. And when you are in Istanbul, you vanish because there are networks which are bringing you very easily to, 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 to Syria. So we have these, these, these people. What we are trying to do uh, is, of course, to prevent them from leaving first, because a lot of families are coming to us. You know, they say suddenly they realize that their teenage, you know, the, the, their son or their daughter actually is becoming a bit weird, doesn't want, you know, he doesn't want to touch his mother or is demanding his mother wear, wears a, we a veil or insulting his sister because she, her skirts are too, too short and so on. So they came to us saying, you know, there is a problem. So we have tried to have a programs to de-radicalize these people. But also before, when you are over 18 years old, you can travel freely. So we have been obliged to have a, a bill at the parliament which prevents the people, we, we can deprive the people from their passport uh, if we are, we suspect that they are, we suspect that they are going to, to Syria. But it means that we have, you know, a potentially hundreds of, 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 of youth uh, who can become uh, uh, terrorists. In our countries, uh, as you know, in, in Europe, we have tough gun law, laws, so, you know, really, uh, which is in a sense a, a way of avoiding uh, a, a lot of, of attacks. But there are trafficking, of course. There are trafficking and there are trafficking of, of heavy weapons com coming from the Balkans. And so they get the, w the weapons from, uh, from, this, uh, from this trafficking. So the threat is there. 
um, France, in a sense, is the front line because the, we have the first Muslim community, we have the first Jewish community in Europe. Um, we are obliged right now to defend the uh, synagogues and the Jewish community centers by the army. Uh, you try to imagine what, 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 what does it mean. Uh, so at any moment, the risk is still, is still there. It's not only a problem in Europe in terms of security, but it's also the problem in, in, in political terms. Because, you know, the political life in Europe is very comparable to the American one, in a sense that you have the same upsurge of the far right. You know, really, in this country, you see it during the, your electoral campaign that you have a, a sort of upsurge of, of the far right, and it's exactly the same in Europe, and exactly about the same, the same scapegoat which is the immigrant, the same scapegoat, the immigrant. So there is the same crisis. So of course, w more you have terrorist attacks, more you have m migrants coming from Syria, more the far right, you know, really is, is, is stronger, you know, uh, is, is stronger. So which, of course, feeds the political crisis that we have everywhere in Europe, since in every European country, but in Germany, I guess, but in Germany, you have a very active far right, you know, in UK with the, the UK IP, in the Netherlands with Wilders, uh, in uh, Finland with the True Finns, and the Fran in France with uh, the, the National Front. So it's not only a security crisis, it's also, of course, it's breeding a, 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 political, uh, a political crisis. It's a, it's a long-term crisis, uh, and uh, we have to work together. In a sense, the US, you are protected by your geography. Uh, you have, uh, I've said that there are around five or 600 French fighting in Syria. The figure for, for the US is 100 Americans. So there are 100 Americans uh, fighting in Syria, which really the, the figure, of course, is, is much lower, uh, which doesn't mean that it, the threat doesn't, uh, doesn't exist. So we have to to work side by side once more, and uh, I think we, we are doing it. The French, we are, we are deploying soldiers in North Africa fighting uh, terrorists, um, and we are, of course, um, our planes are taking uh, part in the strikes with, the, with our American friends in Iraq and, and, and in Syria, and we have, like the Americans, we have special forces uh, deploy, deploy, uh, deploy there, and we, are, we have just deployed uh, aircraft carrier in the Mediterranean to reinforce our strike capabilities uh, against the, 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 the terrorists. So um, military, um, for us, in military terms, uh, obviously uh, the solution will be to put an end to the Syrian uh, war, the Syrian, uh, because the Syrian civil war is uh, the, the place where the terrorists are getting their training, their, their weapons, and also, where it's, you have the migrants, because you have millions of people who are displaced, and, and these migrants are, are coming to Europe. You know, it's very simple. Try to imagine what will be the US if tomorrow one million of migrants will cross the Rio Grande. You know, what will happen you know, in your country? One million suddenly arriving. We close our borders, they are dying on the, our shores. We open our borders, they are coming, and there are millions coming behind. So it's a, it's a sort of uh, impossible situation where the humanitarian and the security uh, constraints, you know, uh, 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 collide, which is, of course, for the public opinion, the European public opinion is, is quite tough. Last point I wanted to, to raise, I will answer all the questions after that. I, I prefer to be a bit short so that it will allow you to raise all the questions. And I accept uh, objections, of course. Uh, the last point is the, 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 the COP21, which is the climate change conference, uh, which is ongoing, in, which is uh, in Paris right now. And, uh, you know, this conference is supposed to, um, to draft and to adopt a convention limiting the global warming at two degrees Celsius, which means four degrees Fahrenheit, in the coming 20 years. Um, it's, it's a tough, it's tough. Um, because, you know, all countries have their legitimate interest. A, a lot of third world countries um, are simply telling us to the West, uh, well, actually, you are trying to prevent us from doing what you have done in the last 50 years. 
basically they consider that you know uh, 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 the, the economic growth uh, they have a right to the economic growth so why should they uh, be uh, less polluting than we the West we have been polluting uh, in the last 50 years so there are there is a real so the Indians basically or the Chinese are saying well wait a minute you know wh why so there are a lot of different uh, a lot of different interests but uh, the fact is and that's I think it's a central point central point is that today uh, no country wants to block the negotiation I think there is now a, a worldwide uh, uh, acceptance that uh, the situation is serious, uh, that the climate change is there. The climate change, of course, is uh, the main activities have an influence on the climate change, and that it could have uh, dramatic uh, consequences on the life of, 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 of on our future. Uh, because you have uh, s s several, you know, for some countries, you know, for instance, the small islands. You have the small islands in the Pacific Ocean, uh, who, which basically are sinking. You know, because in these islands, you know, the fact the water, you know, going up by, you know, alpha inch, you know, it's enough, you know, really to to create major problems for for their for their survivals. You have a lot of enclaved countries, where the 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 the, the desert is moving forward, and and they are already very poor. So that they are really feeling, uh, already feeling the sufferings, uh, uh, you know, which is the consequence of, 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 of the climate change. And, you know, China, you know, for instance, you know, you know, the, 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 you have seen the pictures of the situation, you know, the pollution in, in, the, in the big Chinese cities. So there is also a pressure of the public opinion of China. And I think the President Obama has been quite successful in bringing on board the, the Chinese uh, who have joined now, they have joined the, the common effort. So we will have, we, we have this negotiation going on and it's not very easy to negotiate between 196 parties, 196 parties. Um, but I, in a sense for, for the French, since we are presiding, uh, chairing, uh, sorry, chairing this negotiation, it's not, maybe not the most important factor because if, Cl fighting climate change, in a sense, it's changing the way, our way of life, it's changing the way we, are, we, we will have to consider our economic growth. We are not going to do it overnight. It will take decades. You know, really, frankly, I, we are not going to close the coal mines uh, overnight. It will take decades. We have to change our way of life. And to change our way of life, it won't be a top-down approach. It won't be the state deciding that you have to change your, your way of life. Everybody has to decide to do it. Everybody, the cities, for instance, you know, the cities are responsible of 70% of the emissions, 70% of the emissions. So the cities, and actually most of the American cities are engaged into already into fighting uh, climate change, you know, really. You know, from Houston to, to, to Chicago, you know, really uh, Seattle. I was in Seattle two, two days ago. All this, the major American cities. So there will be in Paris in two days a summit of the big cities organized by Michael Bloomberg, who is the special representative of the UN Secretary General, and the mayor of Paris, where the, the, all the cities are going to make commitments. But not only commitments, but also networking. Because, you know, when you have a city like uh, Mumbai or city like Dakar in Africa, you know, they need our, they need external support for the waste management, for instance. So the cities are going to help each other. So we need the cities, but we need also the business community. And, and there will be also a meeting with the representative of the business community. And frankly, when you, you know, in your country, when you, you listen some comments coming from the, the Congress, uh, the U.S. Congress, you could, you could conclude that actually the Americans are not on board. And when you cross the Beltway, it's the, really it's the opposite. I've met a lot of CEOs and, and all of them, you know, the CEO of Coca-Cola, Delta Airlines, Walmart, uh, Google, you know, they're all on board saying, yes, climate change is serious and we want to fight, to fight against it. Why? First, of course, they have, they have their own uh, uh, ethical uh, convictions. 
But there is a first, f they realized, and uh, that actually fighting climate change, the start is simply to, to go for energy effectiveness. Energy effectiveness, you know, if you put all the Walmart, st the Walmart stores uh, to LED lighting, actually they will, sa they will save those dozens of millions of dollars. Actually, energy effectiveness is you are making money by, you know, really, and at the same time, you are good for climate change. The second one is simply because the consumers, and especially your, you, the consumers between 18 and 35 years old, that for them it's an important topic, and they will, you know, they will, uh, they will take into account the, the, the behavior of, of, of the corporation on this, on this, on this field. So the, the big, the big, uh, the big, the big business is also uh, on board, and there will be, of course, the civil society, the NGOs, the citizens. You know, really. So what we want to get in Paris for us, what will be the success of Paris when, at the end of the conference, which will be on the 10th of December, if there is a sort of common message coming out of Paris, saying we, we being all the stakeholders being the states, the cities, the citizens, the, the corporations, we, the, 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 the world, uh, we, we are serious about low carbon economy. Paris will be a success if it's considered as a tipping point, a tipping point after which, after what, after which, yes, uh, you know, uh, you'll have the impression that all the city debates are, are, are forgotten that we have to, to we, have, we have all of us, we have to work in this direction. And in a sense, the figures uh, are not that important because you don't know, we don't know what will be the technology. You know, I visited a lot of laboratories in this very creative country and I've been impressed by the fact that everywhere you discover that scientists are working on, on you know, solar energy, uh, energy storage, that a lot of, you know, self-sustaining self uh, houses, you know, you have the impression that the technology is there. It will be in two, three, four, five years. So in a sense, the, f the figures that today, tomorrow, you know, you will be able to do better. And, and so I am quite, you know, quite optimistic for which for French, and especially right now, is not that easy. But I guess I'm really pretty optimistic. So I really, and, and of course, in this battle, uh, uh, you are uh, actually our main support and allies. We need you. We need your mobilization. And you, ne you need you to convince, actually, especially your members, your congressmen, you know, really to take it seriously. You know, it's, it's not a topic of political squabble, uh, political game, you know, really. It's not so much my future, because my future is, is behind me. Uh, but it's your future, you know, it's your life, your future, which is, uh, which is at stake. And we can, we can do it. Of course we can do it. You know, really, the price of solar energy has been divided by four in 10 years. You know, we can also divide it by two in the coming five years. You know, really, renewable energy is, is, is not that difficult. And actually, it creates jobs. It doesn't destroy jobs. It creates, it creates jobs. So it's really, we need your imagination your, and your creativity. Thank you very much. So, so the ambassador will take some questions. Uh, again, as I mentioned, we'd ask you to come and form a line so we can move through as many questions as, as you'd like. Uh, Please tell us what you're studying, and uh, please ask a question. We're not interested in a speech right now, uh, but but we'd like to hear we'd like to hear from as many of you as possible. So uh, now's the time to ask some questions, please. So I guess the walk wasn't that long for me, but my question is: I'm actually studying anthropology. My name is Daniel Watts, and I'm currently studying social media and community. And one of the things I've noticed is an existing trend right now in France with the radicalization of youth is that a lot of youth are having these messages from social media or other media forms um, that implement these ideas of anti-Semitism or other um, ideas. Are there any procedures or policies that are currently being implicated in France to combat these um, you know, changing techniques and these changing shifts in community and how people are perceived 
solidarity? No, actually, yes. The question is, the problem is the radicalization of these youth. How do they get radicalized? Because most of their families, uh, most of the families are not. So, so there are, of course, there is not one way of, but there are two, um, two, main, uh, two main channels. The first one is jail. Because a lot of these terrorists actually have been at some moment petty criminals. You know, drug traffickers uh, or, or, you know, petty criminals. And they go to jail and, and of course, Muslims are overrepresented in our, uh, in our jails. And there you have some, some radicals and they are, they are radicalized. So the jail is certainly a problem, but it's a problem which has been also identified in the U.S. And the, and the U.S. actually are putting all the radicals in the same jail, and and maybe actually we we sh we, we could do the same. The second one, the second channel, is internet, and um, because the, the 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 Islamic Caliphate or uh, Daesh or ISIS, uh, as you, uh, you you call it, the way you want, has been very very shrewd in the management of the the social media. I don't know if you remember, there were an, uh, an awful uh, video about the burning of a Jordanian pilot. It was gore, you know, it was really uh, awful. But actually, if you looked at it, you saw that it was very, very well, you know, really very well done. Actually, it was a real movie, you know, really it was well done. So they are very active. They have, they have uh, thousands of, uh, of Twitter accounts, uh, thousands. They are really and Facebook and everywhere. And... Uh, in all the languages, you know, really, they, because you know all these young volunteers coming from Europe, you know, so they use their, their linguistic skills to, after that, to send messages to, to, the, uh, to, to our youth. So we have the problem, uh, we have, we have the pro this problem. So, um, but at the same time, especially after the Snowden affair, uh, it's difficult to, to say, to people of your generation especially, to say, frankly, we should do something on the internet. Because of the, the, pop, the political pressure, we have a law now that we can, uh, the, the, the judge can decide, you know, really that the sites should be deleted. But we, we are not stupid. We know that it doesn't make any sense because 15 seconds later or 15 minutes later, the same sites will come back with a slightly different name, you know, really. So, we have engaged a, a, a conversation with the major internet providers. The French Minister of, the, of Interior went to California in January, trying to convince them that they have a social responsibility. Because in a sense, they have already, you know, basic, the first reaction is to say, freedom, you know, we can't. But that's, actually, they already do it for child pornography. Actually, for child pornography, you you don't know, but, or you know it, actually all the internet providers are already active censoring the internet. They do it, you know, really, on child pornography. So we, we, we were trying to tell them, you know, to also to extend, to widen this, this field of, of social responsibility to, to, to hatred, to, uh, to anti-Semitism, for instance, you know, really. When you are a young guy, when you are 13 years old, you are asked to make a paper on, uh, on the genocide, on the Jewish genocide, you Google, and the five or the sixth site will be a, a site denying the, 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 the Holocaust. So, and when you are 13 years old, you know everything has the same value, more or less, you know, and so on and so on. So we have been engaged in a, in a, in a conversation with the internet providers they're according, I'm not going to give names, but some of them are more cooperative than others, uh, you know, and um, there was an example on YouTube. You had a video uh, when a French uh, policeman was killed by a terrorist in January. Actually, the, he was, actually the, the, the policeman was a Muslim, and he, he had been hurt, and he was lying on the ground, and the terrorist came and, and killed him on the on, you know, really, and it was on, on YouTube, and of course we wanted to, to get it, and, and it took a few hours before we got it. So it was a, a bit of a lesson for us. So we have a, a now direct channels of communication with the internet providers. It's still their decision, but now we are able to tell them that we would want really to, that you, to, you, take, you take off. We are not the only one to do it. The UK we, we, we are, is also doing it. 
in a very strange way, the US administration can't do it because of the First Amendment. You know, really, that's so, it's, it's more, but for the moment, it's, uh, uh, it, it, it's more a question of dialogue with the internet providers. You, after that, the internet providers, they are telling us, they said, yes, you say that there are thousands of, of sites by uh, ISIS, but you should also have your own sites. So the French government, we have a site, it's called stopjihadism.com, um, jihadism in French with an E at the end, uh, but uh, you know it's one. You know, really, again, you you have uh, you will have one, and there will be uh, hundreds or of sites. But uh, for us, it's a, it's a, it's a major concern. There is another concern, which is the encryption. You know, now as you know, you can have encrypted phone, and. Uh, so you, I'm sure you, it's a good way of, it's a post Snowden trauma that you want to have encrypted phone, but you have to understand that it means that a terrorist can go dark and you can't follow their conversation. You know, really it means now that any terrorist, any, anyone, you, you know, really, uh, you can really, uh, you can have an encrypted conversation which the police simply can't have access to it. And you know, and th the question was actually, this question was raised during the last Paris attacks. So there are a lot, of, a lot of questions on the table. And of course, there is a question of the balance between civil liberty and security. And that, you know, it's the, the, the usual, the, the, the very sensitive question that we have in this, sit in this uh, situation. I'm too long. Too <laughs> yes. Bonjour, Votre Excellence. Uh, uh, merci d'être venu. Um, my name is Greg Shumway. I'm a linguistics student here at BYU. The Paris attacks and the attack of the Russian airliner um, over Egypt have um, forged an uneasy alliance between Russia and the West. My question for you is, how is France navigating this uneasy alliance with Russia? And to what extent do you think Mr. Putin will cooperate with the West's objectives in Syria when it comes to combating not only ISIS, but the tyrannical reign of Mr. Bashar, Bashar al-Assad, thank you. No, this, this question is, is allowing me to draw your attention to a linguistic uh, quirk, because in French you say, in English you say that you navigate by ear, in French we navigate by sight, <laughs> naviguer à vue. And so the question, how we do we navigate? We navigate by ear, I guess. No, the, what the Russians are telling us is uh, very simple. They say, you know, we have a disagreement about Assad. Uh, they want to keep the, the, let's go back to the beginning of the civil war in Syria. The Russians have always been very consistent. They said, we don't like Assad, but we prefer Assad to the jihadist. So we'll support Assad as long as we are not sure that the following government won't be a jihadist one. And uh, so now they come to us saying, okay, we know that you don't like Assad, but the Assad is a secondary issue. The primary problem now, the primary issue is fighting ISIS. So let's fight it together. Really, and we'll talk of Assad later on. And you know, really it, it, it has some echo. It has some echo in the public opinion. Uh, you know, the, the, in Europe, the people are so worried about ISIS. They say, well, why not? Let's work with the Russians. Our answer is actually that ISIS is largely the result of Assad. Uh, that actually uh, it's the repression of Assad, the violence, the brutality of the Assad regime, which has brought a lot of Sunni uh, Muslims towards ISIS as a protection against, uh, against Assad. Because for us, we see ISIS only in terms of atrocities of terrorism, but actually ISIS is also seen by a lot of people as a sort of protection protection against Assad on one side and protection against uh, uh, the Shiite militia on the other side. So what we say, we, 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 we tell the Russians is it would be impossible to fight ISIS uh, uh, without first solving uh, the, 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 Syrian, the Syrian crisis. Thank you, Your Excellency, for visiting us. No, stop my calling me Your Excellency. Okay. <laughs> you, know, you know, my mother would love it, but really, frankly, it's... Uh, <laughs> You know, really, in, in 2015, it's not possible anymore. <laughs> you know, really. Awesome. Well, Please. My name is Danny. I'm studying international relations. And I just want to ask about the future of the European project. 
historically it's been the means for so much peace and stability and growth, but in face of all the different challenges, where do you see it uh, going here in the near future? I don't have the answer, <laughs> but uh, uh, I think it's, uh, unfortunately, it's a very relevant question. You know, really, for the people of my generation, building a unified Europe was uh, de soi. it was really coming, you know, well, it was natural. Uh, because it was for us the only way to, in a sense, to solve the German question, you know, really two world wars, um, to, to really to build Europe, you know, to try to get rid or to overcome the nationalistic uh, uh, threats. And the second one was, of course, against the Soviet Union. Now, in a, in a sense, the two, the two reasons are not there anymore. Nobody is afraid of Germany. Uh, Germany is uh, an European democracy and a very close friend, and the Soviet Union has vanished. So the question is there. The, the first question, very easy, so why? Why to go, um, to go further? The, and after that, you have all these shocks, uh, successive shocks. The first one was, is uh, the monetary uh, shock. We have created a monetary union in 2001, and uh, the logic would have been to have a financial union, you know, to have a, 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 an economic government, you know, because if you have a monetary union, you need a, 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 an economic government. Actually, we didn't do it. And uh, because what is happening right now, you know, basically the difference of, of, of uh, economy between Greece and Germany is not actually, is not worse than between two American states I won't give the name of. Uh, but the money is transferred from the rich state to the poor state, actually through the federal government, and nobody knows it. And you accept it, and the taxpayers don't know that actually some of his money is subsidizing some state somewhere else. In, in Europe, we don't have a federal state, so it, each time the money is transferred from Germany to Greece, it's something that everybody knows, you know, really. So we have a problem, you know, really, which the Greeks, the Greek, the Greek crisis was only a, 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 a symptom of this uh, unfinished endeavor, monetary union without an economic government. And, and that's, it's really, it's creating a lot of political tensions. The second one, the second shock is Brexit, which is that now our British friends are going to vote for staying or not staying in Europe. And, and frankly, right now, if you were British, considering all the crises that the Europeans are facing, uh, uh, European Union is not that uh, uh, alluring. So, so we, and if the British leave uh, the European Union, they will vote next year, I guess, or 2017. Um, it would be really, frankly, the beginning of the unraveling. It's, it's really a real, a real risk. After that, you have also uh, now the migrants. As I've said, you know, millions of people coming. It's creating incredible tensions between countries and wh wh which suddenly are building, rebuilding the borders that we have uh, really uh, worked so hard to, to, uh, to destroy. So it's, it's really a, a, a major crisis. It, it's really a major crisis about the European Union. And uh, the European Union is, is in deep crisis. Um, are we going to be able to overcome this crisis? I, I really do hope, you know, really. And uh, um, you may, if you're optimistic, you say it's too late. You know, really, now the Europeans have gone so far into their unification that they simply can't step back. Too many interests, too many common institutions. Uh, but I do believe that the first thing that we should do would be to convince the young Europeans that it makes sense. The problem, again, as I've said, we have this far right now, which is very, uh, very active, uh, like in your country, and it's saying the same thing. We should build walls. It's exactly the same thing. The extreme right in Europe is saying we should rebuild walls at our borders, defend the French borders, and so on. You know, it's the same, the same, the same, the same rhetoric. So the, the, the debate is there, and uh, you're right, and uh, inshallah, let's hope that we'll, 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 su we'll succeed. Good afternoon, sir. Um, my name is Brian Priest. I'm studying Russian here. Uh, my question is, you mentioned that France has gotten more involved in the French uh, Civil War, or sorry, the Syrian Civil War uh, since the Paris attacks. 
Um, I'm wondering, how does this uptick in expeditionary counterterrorism actually serve France's strategic interests? And do the gains from this uptick in attacks uh, actually outweigh the potential blowback that you could experience in France? The first, you know, try to imagine, you know, really your country is struck by a major terrorist attacks. Uh, you know, you have known the story on the 9-11. And in a sense, the first thing that any government should do is to, to show that he's doing something. You know, that, that's also political life. You know, really, your citizens are killed, so you have to do something. So the do something on the short term was to increase our strikes on the, the ISIS. But we do know that actually it won't solve the problem of, of ISIS. Uh, it won't solve it. You are, you are a, a, a military or a cadet, and, and you know that you don't win a war uh, with uh, airstrikes. Uh, you need ground forces, you know, really. And that's our main problem against ISIS, is who will be our ground forces uh, to fight ISIS? Uh, basically, uh, the, 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 Kur the Kurds, who are our best allies, are not going to fight out of Kurdistan. You know, they are f defending their turf, but they are not going to do our, our war. Um, the, the, the Shiites, the, the, the militia, the Shiite militia in, in Baghdad are going to defend their turf. They are not going to. So you make, very quickly, you make a list and you have nobody to do the job. And the Russians come and say, yes, you have somebody. You have the Assad army. You know, really, that's also the, the, the answer of, you know, really. And that's, I think, uh, and our answer is not actually Assad army is the problem and so on and so on. But I think that that's a reason in political terms that for the, the, the coming weeks and months, uh, we have to work with the Americans, with the Russians uh, on our own terms, but to try to find, you know, to answer this question. And the obvious answer is that the ones able to fight the obvious, uh, uh, to fight the ISIS is the Syrians, effectively, but all the Syrians, which means that we are first to solve the Syrian crisis. So after that, the Syrians are able, able to, to, to do the job. So we need a political transition to have a full inclusive Syrian government. Uh, having a Syrian army, which is really the army of Syria and not the army of the of the of the regime, of the regime, so that's that's the, the I guess the long term uh, the long term uh, policy. Uh, I don't think that you know the the terrorists they are going to strike wherever and whenever they can. Whatever we do, you know the hatred or the logic of the terrorist is is not retaliation. There is no logic of retaliation. They are simply striking where, where, where they can. You know, it's, uh, so I don't think there will be uh, in this logic, and, but anyway, we, we don't buy it. Uh, we, we are decided to, to do the job and to do it if, if possible, and we, we, we wish it uh, with the Americans. And, and the problem is, and I do understand it, that from an American point of view, um, Syria is not a core interest. Really, what is your interest in Syria? You know, you don't, you don't need any more the oil from the Middle East because you have the shale gas. So in a sense, you can say that's not your, our problem. And what we are trying to convince the Americans is to say, yes, it's your problem because it's destabilizing your major ally, which is Europe. So you have to, 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 to be more, more active. Hi. My name is Sean Morgan. I'm a teaching social sciences major. The people I just are going to the I lunch, so I guess, you know, <laughs> I feel the, the, the appetite. <laughs> yes. I just came here because I wanted to, not because I was forced to by anybody, but I just had a question about something you said earlier. You said that you were, there were like programs or steps you were taking to de-radicalize mm. the Islamic youth, but you didn't really mention what yeah. those were. So I was just wondering, what are some of those, those steps or these programs that are de-radicalizing the Islamic youth in France? Yeah. No, I, I think all of uh, every, all the countries uh, in Europe have developed, the, the British have done it also, the Germans have done this program, a program of quote unquote de-radicalization, which means working with, the, with, with, Muslim, with Muslim authorities, religious authorities, to try to take these teenagers or usually these guys are really between uh, 16 and 25, 20% are converts. 20% are converts to Islam. And, uh, you, and all of them, 
they have the, the most basic ignorance of Islam. You know, they have taken a few things on internet, but they really don't know really. They, so in a sense, he's trying to, to, to take them and to have courses to explain them uh, what is Islam, what is, you know, really to try to, uh, to bring them into a, a mainstream uh, form of, of, of worshipping. The question is, uh, there is a debate saying, is it effective? You know, really to be, you know, because in a sense we are inventing, we are creating on the spot, you know, something which could, call be, which could be called uh, deradicalization. Deradical, de and, and more our psychologists are not Muslims themselves. So, you know, it's, 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 it's an ongoing process to, to how to, to, to be effective, is it effective? Uh, for the moment we are in really very much in the experimentation phase. Yes. Bonjour. We'll make this our last question. Last question. Sorry. It's a <laughs> uh, bonjour. Vive la France. <laughs> Merci. Je m'appelle Sierra. Uh, J'étudie uh, international relations et le français. Uh, désolé si mon français est mauvais, <laughs> mais je vais Perfect. essayer. Um, uh, C'est clair qu'il y a un peu de, de tension uh, entre uh, la France et la Syrie. Um, si le gouvernement uh, de la Syrie uh, attaquerait la France, uh, croyez-vous que la France uh, serait prête de faire une guerre, uh, plus spécifique, une guerre mondiale? Oh my God! No, <laughs> no, really, you are, you are, you are, you know, really. The question is about, you know, really, war with between France and Syria going to a world war. No, it's um, to be, no, it's uh, from the beginning, you know, in 2011, let, you know, in uh, another lesson in foreign relations is always to go back to the facts, you know, really, very often people draw conclusions before forgetting the facts. The facts was in 2011, there was Pacific uh, demonstrations in the streets of, the, of, the, of, of Syria. Syria was a, a dictatorship. It was at the time of what was called the Arab Spring, so nothing surprising. Actually, there were demonstrations in Jordan, uh, you know, the next door. Uh, the difference between Jordan and Syria is that Jordan tried to include, uh, to speak to the, to the demonstrators and avoided a brutal repression while the uh, Syrians, the Syrian regime, of course, basically uh, shot at the, the, the unarmed demonstrators uh, with his usual, his usual brutality. And little by little, the situation worsened, and it became, after a few months, a real f civil war. So it's a civil war. And from the beginning, the French, but also the Americans and the other ones, who have said that the only solution is Assad out, and that we found a political, a real political uh, transition. You know, really, that's what we have, uh, we have, been, uh, we have been saying. Right now, 250,000 uh, Syrians have been killed, 250,000. Um, half of the Syrian population is displaced, half of the 25 millions of Syrians is displaced, and uh, 6 million, 25% of the population is refugee out of the borders of Syria. It's, it's, an, incredible, it's an incredible tragedy. So not only the, there is the political reality, we have to solve the crisis, which is now threatening the stability of the region and the stability of Europe, but also for humanitarian reasons. Uh, you know, a new winter coming. Um, you know, all the, the vaccination, yeah, there is no vaccination anymore in Syria, so all the disease are, are back. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's really a, a terrible, a terrible tragedy. So there is a, an urgency also on the humanitarian uh, side. We have also values, uh, so we, we should try to, to solve this crisis. Thank you very much. You know, really, I've, I've kept half of my audi audience which is, I guess, uh, quite a result. <laughs> uh, merci beaucoup.